Hi, once again, it's been a pleasure being with you here on GCL Tutorials. Thanks for watching, and I believe you've been enjoying our previous lessons we've had so far. Um, from the demands of my students out there, I've decided to take up a topic on colonization and treat it in series. So, um, in our previous lesson, we actually spoke about the coming of the European, the years of our arrival, and also we looked at some of the activities that they engaged in. Now, today, I would like us to look at uh, or move further to look deeper, to continue with some of the activities that the Europeans uh, engaged in when they came to our land, which was called the Gold Coast. You remember in the last video, we said the Gold Coast um, was the name they gave to this land because of the amount of gold they found, um, especially on our coast. So they related with the people um, settling along the coast or in the coastal areas and they began to um, introduce their culture through the lessons that they had in their schools. Um, they taught their children, the schools that were established for the rich children and uh, the European uh, African children called the mulattoes. So these mulattoes had the opportunity to school and the uh, children from the uh, royal homes also had the opportunity to attend the castle schools. So we had a lot of uh, changes occurring in the lives of our local people, uh, that is to say the blacks, and they were becoming very uh, familiar with the culture of the whites. Uh, to the extent that even some of them were naming their children uh, with white surnames. Okay, so we'll go further and look at the reasons for their coming. The reasons for their coming. So we will be going to my card as I pasted on the board to look at the reasons for the coming of the Europeans. The primary reason for their coming is uh, to trade. So for trading purposes, so as I have here as point one, they came here to trade. And you remember in our previous lesson, we said that the trade um, actually was carried out in many or different forms. First, they started because our people were not used to currency. They started with a butter trade, where they had to trade um, in goods, where they had to exchange the goods for other goods. So they bring what they have, and then they give it to our people, and the people to will give what they also have to them. And that was the exchange. Then the trade continued across the Saharan Desert, where they were trading in items such as ivory, ostrich feathers and ivory is actually obtained from the task of elephant. Those of you play the keyboard a lot, the keys, they use the ivory for the manufacturing of that hard plastic. So it was a very useful um, uh, uh, instrument at that time and or material or commodity at, at that time. So they bought a lot from our people. Um, we can also talk about ostrich feathers, where they had to use the feathers and those days they used them for their descriptions or their writings. So they had long feathers and they had to pour the ink in and use it to, to write. But, but now today we have pens and then we have pencils, so we write with them. Okay. Well, gold was also one of the commodities. But as I said in the last video, I actually mentioned that when they got all these raw materials, they had to use them to produce um, uh, goods or finished goods or goods that will be consumed or will be purchased uh, by uh, other people and use them. So they needed more manpower to work for them. They needed more manpower to work for them. And they came back for our people to um, get a lot of the able men and take them to their country for them to go and work on their farms and also work on uh, work in their factories 
do. So this led to the slave trade. Now, speaking a bit about the slave trade, uh, it was one of the uh, most popular trades in those days, and it was so profitable. And uh, the slaves were actually taken from Africa. So I'm going to draw a pattern. So. I have this sketch as my African continent. So I'm going to leave Asia. Asia is around this place. Then we have Australia here. I'm going to focus on these three. These were together as one before we had to separate them into North America and South America. Okay. So uh, from Africa, most of the slaves were taken from this land. So they took their slaves from this land straight to the Americas, that is the two America, North and South, and to work on the plantation farm. So they were engaging in sugarcane plantation and rice farm. So in the Caribbean, around this place, the slave masters from Europe who go by uh, go into these lands and get these strong slaves, powerful ones of course, to protect them and also work in their industries. And they will still come back to Africa. They will still come back to Africa, take their slaves, take them to their plantations. Those that would be needed in Europe will be bought from this land, taken back to Europe to go and work. And the journey will still uh, head to, towards Africa again. So the movement was actually in a triangular form. The movement was in a triangular form. So the slave trade was also called the triangular trade. The triangular trade. That was the name given to because of the movement. The slaves were taken from Africa to the Americas and back to Europe and then back to Africa. So the movement was in the triangular form, so it was called the triangular trade. And this was popularly known as the Atlantic slave trade. The Atlantic slave trade. Okay. So I won't forget. Let me not forget. So transatlantic. And trans we learned in the other trade, the trans Saharan trade, the transfer of goods or commodities um, across the Saharan desert. So here we have transatlantic slave trade. So we can say, take note. From here, the ocean between America and then Africa is the Atlantic Ocean. So if you are located in the Gold Coast or you are in Ghana, our coastal area we have the Gulf of Guinea and the Gulf of Guinea is the Atlantic Ocean. I hope you get that. So in the Atlantic Ocean, they carry this place, sail them through the ocean, and then took them to the land of America. So the transfer, trans, the transfer of slaves across the Atlantic Ocean. The transfer of slaves across the Atlantic Ocean. So that was it. The main commodity the main commodity were humans. So human beings 
human beings were became the main commodity. So they bought these people, took them to this place, back to Europe, and then came back to Africa. And that was how it continued. And as they realized later that the treatment that uh, was meted out to these slaves was dehumanizing or was not something that um, um, we would say is, is, is making them feel dignified or look like human beings. So they, 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 they had to uh, abort the, the, the slave trade or abolish the slave trade. So in 1807, some countries like the United Kingdom or Great Britain signed the, the Act or parliamentary uh, law, or legislative laws, and then they had to abolish the slave trade. So that was how it ended. I hope you've not forgotten the personalities I told you um, who were very instrumental or who also stood in their feet to fight for these days. So that is what you have to know about the slave trade. I had to bring this because it's one of the uh, most popular trade that, uh, um, that existed in the past. Okay. So we have the triangular trade also known as the transatlantic slave trade. I believe you can give a definition for this by using this demonstration. And you can also tell why it is also called the triangular trade. Good. Now let's get back to the other reasons why the Europeans came to either Africa or West Africa or into the Gold Coast. Good, so we have several reasons over here. The reason number two, we have um, uh, evangelism, for evangelism. So a session of them realized that the uh, uh, people who preach uh, uh, Islam had also, had also prepared their message and they have also entered this land. You know, they had been here long ago. So they had to also descend and then preach and prevent the domination of Islam. So they actually came. So you observe that most of the countries in West Africa, their northern parts are being uh, influenced, or yes, are being influenced by uh, uh, Islam. Yeah. So when you come to the southern part, they have a lot of Christians in those areas. Good. So a uh, percentage of them uh, got this gospel through their evangelism and then they converted to Christianity. So some of them also came and they claimed that the system of worship or the faith of our people, the local people, the indigenous people of our land wasn't, wasn't right at all and wasn't the best. And they saw them as evil and barbaric, so they had to do everything possible to spread um, their good news or the gospel so that people would also convert and uh, they had to uh, uh, do that through their people and they trained young Africans, they trained young Africans, the people were one of those personalities uh, that was trained here and he also expanded the spread of the gospel. Another reason was to discover other parts of the world, was to discover other parts of the world. The white people were adventurous, they wanted to explore, they, wanted, they were just curious, they wanted to see what are the other parts of the world. Names like Vasco da Gama, I'm sure you have heard about, uh, Fernal Gomez, these powerful sailors who uh, sponsored a lot of expedition of voyage um, and let people travel afar to see if they can discover other parts. Some of them also, that would lead us to point four, wanted to know the sea route to India, you know, from Africa. If you locate Africa here, Europe is here, and India is in Asia. Good. So around this place, they want
wanted to locate the sea route to India. So if they want to journey from this part of the world to India, probably they are going to come across different uh, people or uh, this land over here. So when you go to this land, you realize that, okay, so we have, a, uh, we have some people on this land and they have to divert their course and also see uh, the people on this land. So they discovered, in the course of discovering the sea routes to India, they discovered parts of Africa and that was what led some also into this land. Okay, then a fifth reason to spread their culture and governance through formal education. So that was also an agenda. That was the reason because they wanted to dominate the more. So if they come across people or a group of people who do not practice their ways, they try everything possible to uh, uh, let the people also uh, accept their culture. So you remember when we spoke about the three R's, the reading, the writing, and the uh, arithmetic, the other religious instruction. They were preaching the gospel through the religious instruction. And through these uh, three subjects, they made the people understand. So in, the, in, in reading, when they teach you, you are able to, to, to tell that uh, 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 this is what a white man is teaching and you can see their, their way of dressing uh, and you can also tell what they value through most of their readings they brought these foreign reading books that people read and they even had to change their name so we hear of names like so there were names like people very names like Kesi so Kesi Becoming Quincy, Quincy, <laughs> and then Atta, which we know is traditionally we use it to refer to the twin Atta. So Atta, and if you have a surname like Busunfi, Busunfi, Busunfi. And the same name becomes Bosom Field. So instead of they calling Quincy Atta Bosom Field, it becomes Quincy Atta Bosom Field. How interesting is it? Okay, so a whole lot of names were, 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 were changed yeah, due to the Simulation of the white man's culture, or we accepting the white man's culture. So at the point it had influence over our lifestyle anyway. Good. So we'll see whether this helped us or not. The change that occurred in our culture and uh, also how we started learning about so many things that came from the western part and uh, and we'll see how it affected us. Was it uh, positive or negative? So we'll look at the positive and negative effects of colonization or the coming of the Europeans. So keep your fingers crossed. Don't go away. Let's Okay, good. I hope you are still there. Good. good. 
So we have these positive effects and we have the negative effects of colonization. Let's start with the positive. Let's start with the positive. So point one, there was an introduction of formal education. Formal education. So talking about the forms of education, we have a informal one. Our fathers taught us what we should know. Um, and then they didn't draw timetable for us. We don't have to wear uniform before we study. We don't need to. We, we, we learn through observation. So we, they teach us and we observe and we practice what they do. Then, the white man brought his own system of education, which you and I um, have benefited from, no doubt about that. And uh, school, that's schooling, formal education, just schooling. So you go to a classroom, there's a system, there's a structure, they have a timetable, you go in a uniform, and there are principles, and there are rules and regulations governing the school. So that was a school system. So they have brought this, and through this, uh, people are able to um, um, uh, move ahead in life, get to a certain level uh, as far as the academic skills is concerned or ladder is concerned and they have been able to obtain a lot of white color job. Some have learned how to read and write. So the main purpose have been that so for the point one the positive if you are explaining this point because you would have to explain to get your marks. So you talk about literacy, literacy, the ability to read and write through formal education, you've been able to obtain that. That's a pos positive effect. Okay, point two, the introduction of official language, the introduction of official language. So in point two, you know, we have had a big problem in Ghana here adopting what we call the lingua franca, the lingua franca. That's a common language, a common national language spoken. So we haven't accepted one local language uh, as an official language. So uh, we just have to go for a white man's language, and that's the English language, because we were colonized by the British. So through that colonization, we've been able to obtain the English language as our official language. So you need to write that as part of the explanation for the point number two. I hope you are getting the positive effect. So all these things I'm saying, you put them in a statement form, join them together, and then you get the explanation for your point to get your marks. Good. Point number three, introduction of plantation farming. Introduction of plantation farming. Yes, the coming has actually introduced us to a lot of cash crops, cash crops. So cash, you know what comes into your mind when you hear the word cash? I'm sure it's money, right? Good. So money, it's all about the cash we are talking about here. So crops that we can grow and then sell for money. They are the cash crops, simply the definition of cash crop. So they made us to know that we can export cocoa and get a lot from that. And today cocoa, Ghana is the second largest producer in the entire world after La Côte d'Ivoire. So we have the cocoa, we are exporting it, we are getting foreign exchange generating revenue and is contributing to our GDP, gross domestic product. These terms are not too big terms. In our other lessons, we look at them when we get to the social and economic aspects. Okay, all right. So the cash crops um, um, uh, also were introduced into our system. Cafe, talking about cafe, then I also mentioned cotton. Cutting. 
so we can sell all these uh, products of course for money okay development of infrastructure development of infrastructure yes so with this we look at the the facilities so the facilities you should be able to give examples here the uh, things that they had to um, construct the roads the railways especially the railway because if they had to transport our timber transport the gold from far away places a place like Mwase is not close to the coast or coastal area or maybe Kade uh, to Hini Valley so they will construct a railway from there that can transport the goods well people saw it as a way to exploit our minerals but others too were seeing it as for well, development so they have made us to know that we can have railways we can have roads and I'm sure when those places have roads and railways, electricity will surely be uh, uh, provided in that area. So these actually develop places like Accra and uh, Cape Coast, because our capital was first at Cape Coast, capital city, that was later moved to uh, uh, Accra in 1877. We'll get to those events and you also understand. These were some of these are some of the positive effects of colonization, the coming of the Europeans. Well, there are other effects you can look for them. If there is any complex points you don't get clearly, maybe from any other source you have obtained it from, you can put it in the comment box and I will break them down or explain them for you. But I believe with these points you will be able to put words together to form explanations. Good. Mostly, you should have four solid points or five so that you will not um, fail social studies paper as students. Good. Now, let's go to the negative effects. So with the negative effects, we have a distortion of culture. Yes. Anything that has a good side has a bad side. A distortion of culture so you see where our, our lifestyle we have to dress like the white man uh, you've been in the hot sun put on your suits your coat and move around yes <laughs> when they come from a place where there is low temperature so they can manage their coat and but here we live in the tropic zone where there is a lot of heat but we still wear the coats that dressing the language the language yes part of it's an element of culture so it has also been influenced we can also mention our music yes we play enjoy a lot of white fans music so where is our local music the instrument that we used to play or produce such music all have become foreign culture assimilation so our culture has been distorted uh, our ways of prayer and ways of worship a libation, a rich culture, our dance, our food. A lot of people don't like, and it's a problem today. People even reject our local rice and they go for <laughs> foreign rice. A lot, of the, even in our supermarket, we have the locally produced goods or foods that place the last part of the shelf, and we have the one that we have imported from the Western world. Place at the uh, just at the place where you can see the entrance. Uh, why is that so? Distortion of culture. Our mentality has been tuned to the fact that anything that comes from the white man is the best, which is not so. And I believe you also agree with me. Good. Okay. Loss of identity. The able men that were taken from Africa actually lost their identity. How can they locate their family members, their people, their home? So, in, when we are celebrating the year of return, they will just have to come back and then uh, we tell them that this is where uh, you kept, or your forefathers and ancestors were kept. They were taken to the ship, back to uh, an 
no land, a foreign land, a strange land, where they were tortured, where they were maltreated, and all these things. They can only hear the stories and go back to where they are presently settled or located now. They have lost their true identity. What about their names? Our names that carry power, our names that we could mention and they mean a lot. Names that praise God, but we have to change them because of a white man. So, uh, like the example I gave uh, a while ago, the population of labor force, the able men that could have stayed here and developed our land, were taken back or were taken to uh, an unknown land to go and work over there. See how those places have developed. And they can't tell them that our, our hand isn't in our, their development or how they, where they reach. Everything, most of the things they had actually was gotten from us. So they mailed our strength, took our people, they worked for them, and they achieved, got what they had to they get from that. And we are still here. Anyway, sad though. But let's look at another one. Taste for foreign goods. Taste for foreign goods. How many people would choose uh, uh, what we call Akala? My Ghanaian people will understand. Or Kose, or the Asana, the local drink that we make from, from maize. How many people would choose that one over uh, the, the champagne, and the foreign beverages, or the alcoholic beverages that are brought from the Western world? Taste for foreign goods. What about our clothes, the costume? We prefer to wear the, what is from the uh, Western world, made in, made in. We want to see if it is made in outside Ghana. Yes, we don't want to purchase made in Ghana goods. Made in Ghana goods. Okay, distortion of the chieftaincy system. The chiefs were actually relegated, they were, their powers were. Uh, stepped on because we have a strong chieftaincy system. I told you about the ethnic groups, talking about the Asantis. Uh, they had a strong chieftaincy system. Chiefs had to use force or war to conquer, disturb them. We'll be talking about their wars in the beats, and then they were um, broken down. They were broken down. Some of the chiefs that were too strong for them, they had to capture them and take them to uh, exile. So, an unknown land in the form of punishment or as a prison, they were there. Some died there, some were brought back anyway, couldn't do anything. Our chief system was broken. They brought their own system where they had a governor and there was an authority. So, if there is this authority, people must not go to their chiefs again. All issues must be taken to the governor, which uh, I could say that none of them were actually solved. But um, our chiefs became powerless due to the presence of these people. And since they didn't value what we practice, probably you are going to, uh, you can tell that or you, uh, everybody who agree to the fact that, yes, what they practice to make um, the chieftaincy a proper and a solid one will actually be the same as nothing. And that was how things went back. But, well, they are still using their system and their governance today. Democracy, whatever, democracy, constitutional government, and all those things. Disputes are no more settled in the chief, chief's palace. Uh, only people in the community area, but now you have to go to Supreme Court, you have to go to the circuit court, the high court, abuse court, these are all white man's system and it has actually changed our own way of kingship or chieftains. Good. So, things have gone bad anyway, but there is the hope that we have. We can't say it is lost forever. We can still keep the hope alive and there is something we can do. So the question is, what can we do to correct all these negative effects or impact that colonization has had on us? So in a moment,
we'll be looking at So here I have a name. The ways of correcting our negative attitude after colonization. The ways of correcting our negative attitudes after colonization. So point number one, we must grow what we eat and eat what we grow. Grow what we eat and eat what we grow. Sounds like a song, but it's a serious issue. Since we have developed this for foreign years, we have to get back to our our own products. Yes, things that are locally produced here in Ghana. Let's grow them and eat what we grow. So there are policies, nice, nice policies like planting for food and job and all these things. These are powerful policies, but we have to see the real implementation of such policies. If they are being put into proper effect and uh, there's no issue like corruption, bribery, whatever, we'll be able to achieve this. So we wear Ghana, we eat Ghana, and do everything Ghana. We should Think through foreign ideas before accepting them. Let's think through foreign ideas before accepting them. So, probably we may need any help from such people. If there is a need to go for it, we should still check, analyze, and find out whether what help, the help they are giving to us, is there a hidden motive behind? before we accept those ideas or help. We need public the third one, we need public education. We must be educated on the things we have or we should also be taught that what we do today uh, may have consequences. So we need to understand public education will also empower us to value ourselves to understand that we are not uh, we are not just people that uh, we should okay so we need public education that's the third point so you have it here we need public education you must be educated on so many things the education should come with a lot of charge a lot of empowerment we should understand that we are not just a country that will accept anything from any other country and we have to be empowered we know that we have to value ourselves and anything we do has consequences and what can we do to make sure that we break away from the influence of external forces that is it because the future generation will also fall into this same problem if their education does not go down well with them. We must ensure environmental sanitation. Big problem. Big problem. Big problem. It shouldn't be that the capital city or Accra will be made the cleanest city. No, no. The capital towns of other regions, the districts, every place, there must be room. The law enforcement agencies with regards to environmental laws must be on their feet. They must do the right thing. Tell the people, enforce the environmental laws. Keep our place clean. The district officials, what can we do to uh, uh, make our environment clean? Simple rules must be set and must be enforced. The rules are there, but they have to be enforced. We should keep our environment clean. Personal hygiene. Because if we, uh, we are to we suffer from an epidemic, a disease that killed a large number of people. Who knows? Those people will be potential doctors and um, lawyers, doctors, uh, engineers, and so on and so Farmers, for that matter. All these people form part of the human resource. They are very important. Positive work attitude, yes. The thinking that 
if I'm doing a work for someone, the work is not for my father, it's not for any of my family members, therefore I don't have to carry it on my shoulder, I put it on my knee, if it is too heavy, it drops, and that is all. Idealistic attitude towards work, going to work late, taking lotto at work, and sleeping on the job. All these are negative attitude. Let's let's fight against these things and stay positive. We must adhere to our cultural values. Point six: our cultural values. Cultural values perfect. What we have to do is what we do modification. The aspects that are not too good and do not improve our lives, do not reflect on our needs, do not change anything about our doing progress. We can modify them and have better. The true culture, the main culture, what actually defines us and make, uh, uh, makes us Ghanaians shouldn't be abandoned, shouldn't be uh, 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 kicked aside. No, for what the white man has brought, not at all, not at all. We should value all those aspects, the food, the costume, the music, and all these things must be taken into consideration. So these are some of the ways, and after all these things have been done, we just have to try to make sure we prevent the new form of colonization. Let us have that mentality. Because if you are not careful, the white man will come back and the Western world will come and dictate to us again. And that was what, that was Nkuma's fear. Our great uh, uh, father, Nkuma, Kwame Nkuma, sadly for himself, uh, predicted that new coloni uh, colonization or colonialism would be one of the uh, 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 nightmares that would come upon us if we don't adhere to some of these things suggested or stated here. So, after all these, looking at the presence of these Europeans, then they started having intention, they started having intention of colonizing us because they have stayed on the land, they have studied our people and they have been able to, to establish their grounds. So, gradually the the people of Denmark, the Danes left, the Portuguese left, the Swedes left, the Croatians left, the Dutch, the people from Holland also left. And that was how they left their land uh, for the British. So when the British stayed here, because they got a lot up, up, out of the butter trade, it was profitable to them, they got a lot from the slave trade. So they said, wow, if we could stay and rule over these people, well, we could get more. I think that was the idea. So they stayed and colonized them because we had our own system. So they stayed and colonized so they could get more resources and they could still produce more after obtaining the raw materials and bring them back to our country or back to West Africa and Africa for us to buy them again. And this is what led to all these negative impact of colonization. In the course of doing that, the blacks began to wake up from this and some of them were actually not happy with how the white man was trying to uh, dictate certain things. Already in the coastal areas, they have started trading with the people and you remember the Asante Empire actually was extended um, from the middle part of Ghana to the south. And the Asantes were so powerful, so they had a bit of control over the trade uh, um, that they had with the Francis in the coastal areas. So they wanted to dominate. So, and the Francis too did not want that to happen. And since the Francis have now become uh, um, close in terms of relationship with the British or with the whites. The Asantis were not happy with that relationship and the Fantis wanted protection. Then they had to seek that protection from 
the whites. So the British, they came with their soldiers and they had weapons. So they know that if they go into an agreement with them, they will protect them and they will be able to uh, uh, save them from the attacks of the, uh, the, uh, the Asantis. Okay, so we'll look at some of the encounters that Look at some of the encounters that the Asantis had with the British. But in attempt to also take control because of how they weren't happy with the relationship between the Fantis and the British, they were not getting the chance to dominate, control the trade. But the British are taking over. All the goods were going to the British because the Fantis felt uh, uh, comfortable trading more with the British than the Asantis. The Asantis were not happy. So this led to a lot of Anglo Asante wars. So the Anglo Asante war actually talks about the war between the English people and the, uh, the Asantis. So this actually started in the 19th century. And you know the period after. The, the arrival, if you check the arrival of the British, 1553, and now we are in the 19th century. So you will see that they have actually dominated the coast and they've been able to trade with the Francis for um, a very long time. And the Francis were actually comfortable with them. But the British had to um, break that tie or that relationship, and that led to a lot of confrontation. And a lot of wars. Fellow students out there, in our next lesson, we'll be talking about the major political events and we'll begin from these wars that occurred between the Asantis and the British, which we call the Anglo Asante Wars. And we'll start with when the first governor came to the Gold Coast. From that point, we'll get to the major events that took place between the period of 1800 to 1900, and we'll carry on from there. I hope you enjoyed today's lesson. It's been a great meeting that I've had so far with you, and hopefully, and God willing, another time, we'll meet here again and talk about those major political events.